Hello and welcome to this British Academy event. I'm Frahana Hyder. I'm a journalist and broadcaster and a presenter of the BBC World Service's Witness History programme, which looks at important events in history through the eyes of the people who were there. Founded in 1902, the British Academy is the UK's leading organisation for the social sciences and humanities. They are a fellowship of world leading scholars, a funding body that supports new research both nationally and internationally and a forum for debate and engagement. Today's event is the fourth in our series titled Why History, in which we will be joined by British Academy fellows and funded researchers to discuss insights from the past which help us make sense of the present. I am delighted to be joined this evening by British Academy fellow Professor Madawi Al-Rashid. Madawi is a visiting professor at the LSE's Middle East Centre she has written extensively about Saudi Arabia's political development since the Arab uprising and is one of the foremost authorities in the country. She's written a number of books on Saudi Arabia, but it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Madawi to discuss her most recent book, The Sun King, Reform and Repression in Saudi Arabia. And I have it right here. Um, please note that the British Academy will share a 25% discount code with, with attendees following this event. And if you'd like to purchase a copy, I would highly recommend it. I've read it and I've learned a lot and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Madawi and I will be in discussion for about 40 minutes before taking a selection of audience questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit this via the Q&A function. You are, of course, welcome to tweet during the event and can copy in at British Academy. Welcome, Madawi, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. To start our discussion, um, I wanted to touch on your background and how it's informed your career as an activist and as an academic. Um, can you tell us how your upbringing and being part of the Saudi diaspora has shaped your sense of identity? Yes, uh, every author uh, must put him, insert himself or herself in the narrative that uh, uh, he or she writes. And I made sure that the reader of The Sun King knows where I'm coming from. Um, I uh, uh, grew up in Saudi Arabia and uh, went to school there uh, until sort of the late 1970s. And there, uh, my, my family comes from a certain part of Saudi Arabia in the north where they had uh, conflicts with the Al Saud dynasty. And since 1921, they lost their um, uh, sort of power and they lived in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. And I grew up in Riyadh. Uh, but then um, the uh, mistrust continued between my family and the ruling uh, group in Saudi Arabia, the House of Saud. And in 1975, we were forced to leave the country. But I was just a young uh, a, a girl uh, studying in the in middle Middle school, so we, we, uh, my family uh, left Saudi Arabia, and uh, although there had been some uh, trips afterwards, and I went back uh, because there were sort of uh, reconciliation between the regime and my father. But my break with the regime came in 1991 when I published my PhD thesis, and it was on uh, actually the history of Northern Arabia. And it came out as a book entitled Politics in an Arabian Oasis. And I looked at a, a question that always fascinated me. Uh, can tribal societies, or what is known in, in locally as Bedouin societies in the north of Saudi Arabia, form states? And why some states uh, disappear and fail and others succeed. Mm. So that book uh, uh, upset the Saudi king at the time simply because I chose my case study to be the history of my own family who lived in the north of, of the country. Mm. And after that, um, they objected to the publication of, of the thesis and also threatened me with disciplinary action and at that point, in the late, sort of very early 1990s, I realized that writing history is a dangerous 
a profession. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of oscillated between looking at history, at the history of Saudi Arabia, and also combining that with my training as an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. So exile and diaspora are very central in, in my thinking. And this is the personal narrative that I come to the um, 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 my academic studies uh, with. Um, and the, every author has a personal narrative, a personal history to explain his or her interest in a particular subject. For me, studying Saudi Arabia became a way of connecting with the homeland. Of course, as a young uh, person growing up in the country in a particular family, I heard the, their oral stories about the past. But I wanted to give these stories an academic framework and look at other sources in order to explain um, um, you know, the country to outsiders who don't have access to it or who don't understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, from the 1990s, after I finished my PhDs, I continue to write about Saudi Arabia. And I must say that uh, what fascinates me is the story that is untold. Um, as as you know, all governments, all states, especially in, in that part of the world, try to frame the historical imagination and control it, uh, mm. depending on the ideology of the state. And I was subjected in Saudi school to that ideolo um, ideology in, in, in teaching people history. And of course, history is always written in that context by the winners. And therefore, when I started my academic work, I wanted to give a, a different kind of history that uh, branches out and considers different uh, narratives. Um, and, and it is very difficult to say that you know, there is truth in, in that history that is taught at schools because it, it has a particular purpose to mm -hmm. sort of glorify um, the rulers of the kingdom, to say that the country is just um, incredibly uh, advanced, etc. And to write a critical kind of history and combine it with an understanding of the present becomes a very dangerous project in Saudi Arabia. And so since I started publishing, writing in newspapers as well to reach a wider audience, giving talks and seminars, and I became persona non grata and uh, my nationality was withdrawn in 2005 uh, simply because I went on television to talk about the participation of Saudi women in the municipal elections, which the, uh, uh, the government didn't like. So we, they just struck me out as a non-citizen. And, uh, uh, and that's how these governments sort of deal with any kind of voice that offers a different interpretation of what is going on at a particular moment, whether it's the past or the present. Mm. I mean, you touched on so many different and interesting themes and talking about narratives and uh, and having a different narrative. Your book, The Sun King, um, has, a, has a different narrative to uh, academic scholarship previously about Saudi Arabia. And only recently has it moved on beyond the focus on oil and religion. Why do you think that is? Yes, since uh, uh, um, sort of Western academic interest in Saudi Arabia started, uh, it actually started uh, very, very early on um, by travelers uh, who went to look at the sort of landscape, the archaeology. Uh, some of them had other objectives to um, sort of find out about politics and alliances between tribal groups. So there was this travel literature on Saudi Arabia. But since the discovery of oil in the late 1930s, and especially after the Second World War, uh, most of the academics who went to Saudi Arabia were political scientists, and they were men. Uh, because the country is not uh, easily accessible uh, 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 you know, to women uh, researchers. So Western knowledge about Saudi Arabia was really geared towards studying the stability of the country, the oil resources. And there was this fascination with this Wahhabi tradition, which was extremely important in the formation of the state. So uh, most of that literature was about oil 
religion, and the royal family. Um, and not many uh, uh, academics or researchers were able to sort of study society, except in, in the late 1990s. And the interesting thing is the Saudis themselves began to contribute to that knowledge as they uh, were trained in universities and obtained their PhDs and they chose to write about their own society. So they're inserting themselves in the historical narrative that we have and also access to the local, resource, local sources, uh, knowing the language and the nuance of the society and culture gives their voice a strength that is perhaps lacking in other types of knowledge. Um, so moving on to MBS, and for the benefit of those attending today, could you briefly talk about the rise of Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, also known, uh, of course, as for short as MBS. What impact has his accession had, A, on the monarchy, and B, more widely, on the so-called Saudi social contract between the government and its citizens? Yeah, I think um, most people would put a date on the rise of Mohammed bin Salman as uh, 2017, when he was appointed crown prince. But mm -hmm. I would go in earlier than that. And as uh, history shows us that there are uh, certain questions that uh, keep coming uh, throughout that period. And I would start in 2011, uh, during the Arab uprising, when mm. uh, the whole world was you know, uh, astonished by the masses that went into the public squares in the cities in Cairo, in, uh, in Sana'a, in Yemen, in Bahrain, in, in Damascus, and elsewhere. So the, pro the, 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 the whole world saw how young the, the Arab population is, the mm. demography of it is specific. And um, they saw what those young people wanted. Mainly they wanted to overthrow this sort of dictatorship that had been in power for over 40 or 50 years. Um, and also they wanted freedom, they wanted dignity, they wanted, hum they wanted human rights in general and equal distribution of wealth. And Saudi Arabia was not actually shielded from that wave of 2011. Mm. So um, uh, some Saudis on a smaller scale went out into the streets and started demonstrating and there were a lot of agitations at the time. And uh, given that background, we have a, a, a leadership in Saudi Arabia that is aging and the succession to the throne uh, passed for, uh, throughout the 20th century from one king to his brother. But by the time we get 2011 and even 2015, there were no longer brothers who are actually sons of the founder of the kingdom, Abdelaziz ibn Saud. Mm. So uh, King Salman came to power in 2015, and it was time to move the succession from the horizontal line that it had followed throughout the, uh, the 20th century to the vertical line, meaning that uh, uh, appointing um, crown prince who is actually his son rather than his brother or another prince. And this is a major change in Saudi Arabia. King Salman had to do this because there were no brothers left or eligible ones. Um, and uh, he chose this um, unknown uh, son of his who was very young, inexperienced, and the world hadn't really heard of him much before that time, 2015. Although he had some kind of government jobs before during the time of King Abdullah, the one who was king before King Salman. So uh, they th that it, the choice was that Saudi Arabia needed a young uh, prince uh, to uh, understand the demography of, of the country and he's close in age to the people he's supposed to rule, unlike his father or his uncles who ruled before. I mean, they were in their 80s uh, and 90s even. So um, it, it was thought that... Uh, uh, the prince, the young prince, will actually appeal to the youth and mitigate against a kind of revolution along their lines that we had witnessed in 
in, in Syria, in Egypt, in Tunisia, and elsewhere in the Arab world. So Mohammed bin Salman also was, was given the project to liberalize Saudi Arabia in inverted commas, uh, mm. meaning uh, it had to be open socially. He had to uh, show the world that Saudi Arabia is now a modern country under his leadership. So he allowed women to drive. He opened it up for tourism. He opened this the entertainment industry and tourism. In addition to doing some re uh, 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 some projects to uh, change the economy from an oil-based economy that is state-centered to an open economy, a liberal economy, whereby foreign investment would come into the country in partnership with the government or uh, as independent corporations uh, to settle in Saudi Arabia and generate jobs and money. So th this was the idea, but that the choice did not involve any kind of political uh, reform. So the monarchy will stay as an absolute monarchy, but now we have this image of an enlightened, young, energetic reformer king in the future. And uh, th this was, um, I think, the, the um, understanding um, uh, uh, of why Mohammed bin Salman would come uh, uh, and rise in such a, a short period of time and also amass so many jobs uh, in, in his portfolio. So he's <laughs> crown prince, minister of defense, head of the economic council, uh, and so many other, uh, other functions of the state uh, became under his control. I mean, you describe in your book the cult of MBS. Um, how has this cult, uh, how has it um, influenced, um, how has he used it as soft power to influence um, foreign policy in the West? I mean, to promote both Saudi Arabian interests abroad and to launch his reputation in the West. How has this approach deviated from previous leaders? Yes, um, every king had his own cult. Uh, but there are differences. Uh, so uh, previously, uh, uh, the king uh, cult, if you like, whether it was King Abdullah or even King Salman himself, the current king. So King Salman uh, adopted this sort of uh, image that he is um, a decisive king. And he, uh, this decisiveness was related to uh, uh, stopping Iran's expansion in the Arab world, and he launched the Yemen war within three months of becoming king. So he got the title as the king of decisiveness. Um, the, pre, the king before King Salman, King Abdullah, also had this sort of image as the king of humanity. And he was this aging patriarch, mm -hmm. the father of the nation, and mm -hmm. the benevolent sort of father. And, but we come mm -hmm. to um, Mohammed bin Salman. He differed in, in, in forming his cult from the previous kings. The previous kings had local cults. But Mohammed bin Salman wanted to project his cult abroad and globalize himself simply because the economy needed this globalization. So mm. we find images of Mohammed bin Salman on buses in London when he visited, uh, on taxis in London, on uh, on uh, you know huge posters in Washington and in other capitals of the world, um, and you think why would a young uh, prince, who's the crown prince, project his cult abroad. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, many people fell for uh, this sort of cult and became supporters or followers or gurus, I would say. He also uh, had a lot of um, investment in public relations company to promote him as the new face of Saudi Arabia, because he was not that known before. Um, and he hired uh, PR companies to actually uh, promote his image as this reformer, as this person who is young, energetic, who could revolutionize Saudi society and make it modern. 
many Western journalists were invited to Saudi Arabia. And he started giving interviews to The Economist, The Guardian, The Washington Post, uh, and, and many, many other new, uh, new uh, global media in order to promote himself as the new face. And if you wanted to do business with Saudi Arabia, you need to come to Mohammed bin Salman. <laughs> I mean, let's stay with perceptions um, of, the, in, of, the, of the crown prince in the West, Madawi. And I just wanted to touch on a, a couple of controversial things. Firstly, about Brian Fogel's uh, documentary, The Dissident, about the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, who's, uh, which we will discuss a bit further on, um, but which was not, uh, which was released this month, but without any major distributor. Um, and again, Hassan Minaj is um, the comedian Hassan Minaj's series Patriot Act, when he criticised the Crown Prince after uh, Khashoggi's death, um, that also was in controversy. What do you think? And um, Netflix um, took it down. What do you think um, when this happens? Were you surprised at all? Um, well, it is a little bit. Uh, uh, it's censorship. Um, practiced by these corporations that have interests in Saudi Arabia because uh, the, the repression in Saudi Arabia has gone too far um, and they could actually punish a, a, a Netflix or equivalent if they air something that is regarded as against Saudi Arabia. And this is uh, corporations uh, promoting their economic interests at, at the expense of freedom of speech, uh, at the expense of having the slightest sort of concern with the abuse of human rights. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily, um, many Saudis uh, will see the dissident, the film, <clears throat> because they have learned how to live with censorship how to live with control over the internet and they will they will be able to see it but for netflix a corporation to do that is actually disgraceful and um, so if, if they abide by the rules of the country where they are working but these rules are oppressive and they deny citizens freedom of speech and therefore they want them the saudi regime wants saudis to see one version of reality and this is a characteristic of dictatorships. If, if one thing that really, really upset dictatorship, it's not like you know the secret cells that these ones are easily dealt with, the secret cells or the, the political violence. But what they can't tolerate is a history book or a tweet or a, a film, a documentary film, because they want to have monopoly over mm. people's consciousness and awareness of reality. And this is why Netflix succumbs to that pressure, because it wants to continue to do business in Saudi Arabia. I mean, we talked about Saudi Arabia human rights, um, and we mentioned to uh, the regime's propaganda. Can you talk about the duality and inherent contradictions of reform and repression as it affects women's lives in Saudi Arabia? Yes, um, I mean, Mohammed bin Salman promoted himself as a reformer, but at the same mm -hmm. time, we see the abuse of human rights had gone you know, beyond like uh, imagination now. Um, to, for example, when it comes to women's cases, uh, we, we know that his reform involved giving women the right to drive, the right to travel abroad, have a passport, to register their marriages or children, etc. So that is called social reform. But mm -hmm. why at the same time put in prison the feminists who had been calling for these reforms for years? before Mohammed bin Salman came to power. And the, the only reason I can understand why he's done that is because the feminist movement in Saudi Arabia was one of the most organized social movements. And also uh, the regime felt um, threatened by it because he knew, uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, uh, and the regime in general knew that um, the feminist movement is not going to stop when the right of to drive a car is granted. Mm -hmm. uh, they also appeal to a cross-section of Saudi society, the feminists. So in a way, they um, uh, uh, surpass 
the uh, divisions in Saudi society along regional, tribal, or ideological lines. Um, so they were building a, a, a base uh, of uh, activists and uh, um, people who wanted to see real political change. I think because many of those feminists understood that uh, women's rights cannot be achieved under a dictatorship. There has to be a, a kind of opening up of the political system in general for women to have a better uh, a, a sort of chance at equality. And, and therefore, Mohammed bin Salman put these women activists in prison and uh, they are still there three years after they were detained. Uh, and the most famous of, of those feminists is Lujain al-Hudlul, who mm -hmm. was recently um, sentenced to several years in prison uh, with the hope that she might actually be released in uh, uh, spring, but nobody knows. And, and also the torture that they had been subjected to. Uh, which is horrifying, and this is based on evidence from the family of, of Lujain al-Hudlul who speak to her. And uh, they could not possibly be uh, uh, lying simply because they know if they, uh, they kept quiet at the beginning because they didn't want to provoke the regime uh, it, it more. Um, and when they gave up that their sister will have a, a better uh, or a fair trial, they started speaking up and, and uh, telling the whole world what uh, Lujain al-Hudlul, a 30-year-old woman, is subjected to in Saudi prisons. I mean, Madawi, when do you think we will see genuine reform um, in terms of women and women's rights in Saudi Arabia? Do you, do you see that happening under Mohammed bin Salman? Absolutely not. And, and I don't see women's rights as a separate area of social life. You can reform it. You can reform the legal framework. You can give women uh, more visibility or empower them, appoint them to a high sort of uh, ranking positions, as Mohammed bin Salman had done. Um, for example, now the Saudi ambassador to the US is a princess. Uh, and everybody thinks that this is empowering women. So you pick a princess and send her to Washington uh, to have a good sort of communication skills to convince uh, the, the Americans that Saudi Arabia is changing and now we have a women uh, ambassador. But that uh, appointment doesn't really mean empowerment. Um, and I don't think that women's rights can be isolated from general uh, rights. Uh, civil and political rights. Um, and as long as the, uh, uh, the political reform is blocked, uh, I don't see um, a greater change except uh, these minor changes that are extremely important for women. I mean, Saudi Arabia was the last country to allow its women to drive a car. And the right to movement is, is a universal right. But even with these reforms of Mohammed bin Salman, a woman in Saudi Arabia now, now after the reforms, cannot marry uh, without the permission of her guardian. So the, the, there are limits to this reform. And sometimes you have um, commentators saying that, well, it's incremental. You can't change society so quickly. But when Mohammed bin Salman wanted to change society very quickly in limited areas, he was able to do so. So Saudi Arabia, uh, before the pandemic, um, was able to host uh, international entertainers, musicians, uh, pop stars to come to Saudi Arabia. And that was done just because it's the will of Mohammed bin Salman. And of course, it's also part of diversification of the economy because these concerts bring money and it's all partnership with the government. So to increase the revenues at a time when oil prices are collapsing, um, uh, he was forced to, to diversify in, for example, tourism and entertainment, and also in the hard industries, such as you know, uh, petrochemicals and other, other type of industries.
I mean, we touched on this right at the beginning of our discussion, but you are very much a part of the Saudi diaspora scattered across many continents. And you argue in your book that the recent duality of reform and repression, which we've just been discussing, had made has made Saudis leave the country. What kind of activist role did exiles play previously prior to the extension of, of MBS, of the Crown Prince? Yes, it's interesting that Saudi Arabia is not a country associated in the mind of outsider uh, with uh, asylum seekers or refugees. But from the uh, 18th century, there had been waves of I wouldn't call them exiles at the time, but they were waves of people leaving the country for political reasons or economic reasons. So if we are going to talk about the political reasons is that the rise of the Wahhabi movement, which was a radical interpretation of Islam, pushed many people to leave the, 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 the territories under the control of the Saudi Wahhabi dynasties. So they had migrated to countries like Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and even Egypt, and to other Gulf countries in order to escape religious repression. Uh, but the, since the discovery of oil, Saudi Arabia had known many exiles and Saudis became entangled with um, you know, ideas uh, that flourished in the Arab world, such as uh, socialism, nationalism, um, and, and, and leftist sort of politics. Um, in the 50s, uh, there were uh, uh, exiles who wanted to start uh, or establish trade unions in the oil industry, but of course they couldn't because trade unions are banned, so they had to flee the country. Uh, but what is interesting about the new uh, exiles who had come in the last, I would say, five years, uh, they are younger than the previous generations. Some of them haven't even started their university and they had decided to leave the country. And you see amongst them, you know, they are reflection of the youth of today. They are active as bloggers, uh, they tweet heavily, they use social media, and all these kind of new communication technologies had put them in trouble because the regime doesn't tolerate any dissenting voice. And support, for example, when they support causes outside the country, uh, if the cause is not supported by the government, then they become suspicious. And you could actually go to prison uh, after a tweet in Saudi Arabia. I mean, so we, they are younger, the exiles are younger, they are very, very well connected uh, um, uh, on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually amongst them, there is a high proportion of women. In the past, women didn't leave the country. Um, they only left if they married someone who moved abroad. But I was, I was actually shocked by the number of women who had left Saudi Arabia at a time when there is reform. So if, if they wanted to drive, well, Mohammed bin Salman gave them the right to drive, but why did they leave? And in the book, I explain why some of them leave uh, for political reasons and sometimes for personal reasons. Um, one problem is the runaway girls in Saudi Arabia. And these were young girls I would say 18 or 19 year old, who would uh, go on holiday with their families uh, and, and stay behind, refusing to go back, or they just get on a plane with their passports and they go to a, a, a country and they are stranded at airports seeking asylum and UN agencies have to intervene. So this is very, very new. We haven't seen it in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they, the, the girls are very well connected and they uh, have a, a strong voice. And they, once they reach the safety of a country, they start telling their stories. So in the book, I wanted also to capture that moment, uh, which is very, very unique and unusual. Yeah, I mean, yeah, fascinating. Absolutely. I was fascinated by that part of your book. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to touch on before we go to questions, which we will do shortly. But Madawi, let's talk briefly about Jamal Khashoggi's brutal murder. Um, do you think it has emboldened the diaspora? Well, uh, the, the, the event was shocking. 
for those who had left Saudi Arabia, the diaspora and the exiles, simply because they thought that they are now uh, asylum seekers in, in uh, Canada, uh, the USA, Britain, Europe, Australia, and other places, they thought that they have reached uh, safety, uh, a safe haven. But they were proven wrong when the murder of Jamal Khashoggi became, you know, world news. Um, and at the beginning, th there was, um, I think I remember I was just following the uh, and doing the research for the book. There was a moment when we all felt threatened. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you know, the, our phones were uh, subject to hacking. I myself had my Twitter account hacked uh, uh, before Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, in 2014, um, and we knew that our, uh, uh, you know, phones, devices, tablets, um, they can get us uh, because the Saudi regime had invested heavily in surveillance technology, and he uh, and the regime is assisted by Western countries and by Israel recently in order to control. The, the narrative and see exactly what's going on in, in society. So the exiles felt uh, fearful for their life. Uh, but of course, they were living as peaceful citizens in, in their countries uh, of asylum. Uh, and it took only months, I would say, uh, before they relaunched themselves and became really determined to, um, uh, you know, to fight for their rights, for freedom of speech, for political change. And I've seen young Saudi exiles standing in front of the Saudi consulate in London, in Mayfair, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, holding uh, signs and uh, waving flags, uh, wanting justice um, uh, for Jamal's murder. Um, they also have become very, very active internationally, as many of them became human rights uh, activists and defenders. They go to uh, the UN Council on Human Rights in Geneva. They uh, do hearings at the House of Lords or the House of Commons in London and Congress in, in the U US in order for the world to, to hear their story. Uh, so Saudi Arabia is not all about wealth and oil. It's also about this repression that is unbearable. And mm -hmm. one thing we have to understand is many of those exiles um, in their 30s or early 40s, they still have families in Saudi Arabia. And there is one case of Omar uh, Abdul Aziz Zahrani, whose life story I mentioned in the book. He had almost 18 members of his family and uh, friends uh, detained after he uh, were, uh, left to, to seek asylum in Canada. And the pressure on these young men and women is incredible because if you leave and you become active abroad, then you your family is affected, is, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, members of your family can be taken to prison as, as happened in this particular case. So there is this group punishment. Mm -hmm. if, if a son has left the country, uh, then the whole family has to pay a high price. Madawi, as we are all very much aware, there'll be a new administration in the US very soon. MBS has, of course, uh, been a big friend of President Trump. What should the priorities be for the new Biden administration with regards to US-Saudi relations? Well, um, the US administration had seen many uh, sort of uh, uh, administrations come and go. Uh, but the fundamental issue, not only for the U.S., but also for countries like Britain, France, and other countries that are heavily involved in arming Saudi Arabia, I think the fundamental question is to ask uh, whether um, continuing this uh, unconditional support for a dictatorship, for an absolute monarchy, uh, is good strategy in the long term. Mm. Uh, in the short term, it may lead to sort of uh, the illusion of stability in the country. But we know that uh, this kind of veneer of st 
instability can erupt. And in Saudi Arabia, it has erupted before in the form of this jihadi violence and a global jihad. When you deny people every single uh, opportunity to participate in the decision-making process or in policy, you criminalize civil society, you ban trade unions, you ban political parties, you do not have an elected uh, parliament, when you do not have an elected government. I think in the 21st century now, Saudis, like everybody else in the world, seek certain political rights. And mm. when, when governments, whether it's Biden or Trump, um, continue this unconditional support, then we're going to have a backlash, I think, and the implosion will be very, very dangerous. So Biden might reconsider this sort of unconditional support to Saudi Arabia. And I think um, one hopes that his administration will pursue a different foreign policy, not only in Saudi Arabia, but in other parts of the world where absolute dictators reign you know, uh, forever. Um, so Biden himself had made some comments uh, about seeking justice for Jamal Khashoggi, also about uh, a kind of reconciliation with Iran or engaging Iran in discussions. Um, uh, also, he's made uh, uh, some comments about supporting democracy in these countries. Uh, we have to wait and see. It's not very clear that Biden will actually change uh, American foreign policy in a dramatic way. Uh, I think there will be some kind of changes, but they will be limited, especially at a time when the whole world is just suffering, you know, under under this uh, uh, pandemic, mm. and uh, it is nobody wants to rock the boat more than the pandemic has done. So I, I don't have great hopes that there will be serious change of American foreign policy, but we might see some minor um, uh, changes. Madawi, it's nearly time to take a selection of questions from the audience. But before um, I do that, can you tell us what you're planning next? Where are you going to take your research? Well, I have some ideas, but I mean, the book has just come out. And uh, at the <laughs> moment, I'm thinking about what the next project is going to be. I have been thinking about uh, history of cities where I lived. As I've been living, uh, I lived, um, you know, since a very young age in many, many cities. Um, I lived in Lebanon under, uh, it's like civil war. Uh, I lived in France. I lived in Britain during the Thatcher years. And mm. um, I moved to Singapore as well. So uh, what I would like to do is uh, write um, a sort of a history book, uh, but it's not like a traditional a history book. What I would like to do uh, is write about life in those cities during the years when I was there. Um, and I'll see. It's just the problem at the moment is inability to travel because of the pandemic, and that might limit my access to resources and research material. So we'll have to wait and see. Madawi. It sounds Fascinating. Um, the questions have been piling up, so it seems only fair that I should go to them now. Um, someone is asking about uh, Lujine Al Haluth, who we touched on previously, and other activists that are facing detention and false charges. What kind of intervention, according to you, would help them? Um, I think, you know, this, from the point of view of the Saudi regime, they think that uh, detaining Lujain al Hudlul and her uh, uh, other and, and the other activists is a domestic matter. Mm. But I think uh, Western government can play an important role. Um, uh, and here, I want to um, sort of warn against military interventions. Uh, when when uh, some academics or exiles ask the West to act, they do not mean military in, uh, interventions by the West, because that had proven to be disastrous in the Middle East in general. What I mean is use legal means 
uh, in order to put pressure on the regime. So, for example, freezing assets of the regime. The regime is extremely dependent on Western investment and mm. technology uh, in addition to security. And these can be bargaining, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, elements in a, a relationship between Western governments and a country like Saudi Arabia. They can be uh, uh, the dependence on these kind of support should be uh, conditional on Saudi Arabia and the regime behaving like a respected member of the international community and abiding by international norms and values, especially when it comes to human rights um, in the country. So they can do a lot to put pressure on the Saudi regime. And to just give you one example, in the 1960s, very early 60s, uh, President Kennedy in the US put pressure on the Saudis to free slaves so slavery wasn't abolished in Saudi Arabia until 1962. And why did uh, Kennedy put pressure on the Saudi king to abolish slavery? It's because Saudi Arabia needed US military assistance in a war that it was launching against Yemen in the mm -hmm. 1960s. Well, I mean, there is a history of wars uh, in that part of between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. So for the Americans to enter into this war on the side of the Saudis, the Saudi king had to accept to abolish slavery. And, and the same thing could be done now by the Biden administration, by the British government. But I don't really have a great hope, especially in Britain, as Britain now is... Uh, under the weather, I think. And they would jump on any opportunity to, to trade and invest and, and, and seek um, uh, um, help from countries that are regarded as wealthy. So I don't see the British government exerting any pressure on Saudi Arabia to, to respect human rights. Um, so we shall see. If there's a will, it can be done, but there has to be a will. Um, someone else is asking that um, they have seen that online that over 100,000 trips are made from Saudi Arabia to the UK each year. Presumably those are tourists enjoying the UK. Um, why don't the concepts of freedom, democracy and equality for women increase as a result, this person is asking? Well, I mean, visiting a country doesn't actually make you, um, uh, you know, respect human rights. Um, and it's interesting uh, if you um, look at what travel uh, does to um, uh, the individual. It's not necessarily a positive outcome. Uh, we have this sort of rosy idea that we travel, it's a sort of a liberal idea that we travel to learn about other cultures, enjoy other uh, ways of living. But sometimes people come back to their country and they cling to, to uh, what they had been brought up with. So um, also even with education, uh, in the, uh, since like 15 years ago, Saudi Arabia started a massive scholarship um, a program whereby they sponsor students from Saudi Arabia to go and study abroad, mainly in Western countries, from you know Canada or US to Australia, um, and and this exchange is extremely important. But um, you have to realize that when those students come back to Saudi Arabia, they are very much dependent on government jobs. And if you have been active while you're a student, then you will never be given a, a job. In fact, you might actually have your scholarship cut, uh, abolished, and you'll be stranded abroad. Uh, you can't pay your fees in Canada or the US. Um, or if you go back to Saudi Arabia, you will be detained. So individuals balance these kind of uh, a personal uh, you know, cost and benefit sort of analysis. And uh, some of them had, had actually sacrificed all the benefits that come with a scholarship or with going back and getting a government job. And this is why we have these exiles in the diaspora. And they refuse to, to go because they're fearful for their life. 
uh, although some of them had to accept sort of downward social mobility uh, with no income. Some of them, you know, take jobs that they were not trained to take. They were trained to be, you know, uh, doctors, engineers, or professionals, and especially those who were studying for higher education. Um, so they accept all the trauma of exile, loss of family, loss of income for freedom. And um, their numbers are increasing. But I think they're very hopeful that one day they'll be able to enjoy freedoms in their own country. So fascinating. Um, someone asking about UK-Saudi relations, Madawi. How has this relationship been defined, redef been defined, sorry, in recent decades? Yes, I mean, everybody knows that Britain played an important role in the creation of Saudi Arabia in the First World War and its aftermath. Um, and Britain had great influence in Saudi Arabia, I would say, until the Second World War, uh, when the United States replaced Britain as the main sort of supporter of the regime. And Britain had to accept a lesser role, but um, it continued to arm uh, the Saudis, especially the Saudi National Guard. There are more than probably 30,000 uh, British expats in Saudi Arabia before the, the pandemic. I, I'm not sure what the figure is now. There are lots of exchanges, students come to study, there's a cultural sort of program, an English language uh, uh, program uh, through the British Council and British universities. Uh, but uh, Britain has always thought of itself that uh, Saudi Arabia is important. Uh, it's mm -hmm. part of the, the sort of colonial or imperial legacy uh, that you know Britain can project power in, in Saudi Arabia. But at the moment, I think with many other international actors, Britain's role is diminished in a country like Saudi Arabia. So China, Russia, and many other countries are coming into Saudi Arabia for financial and business investment, uh, not at the moment with, with the pandemic, but before. Um, and Britain is just one country among many others who that have vested interest in continuing to, to have access to Saudi market. Interesting. Um, Madawi, um, something we haven't touched on here, but someone's asking about, could you please um, discuss the role of artists in promoting social change in Saudi Arabia? And this person names a couple of artists. They say that thinking about people like Ahmed Mehta and Abdul Nasir um, uh, Gerem. Yes. Well, uh, uh, the art scene uh, was extremely vibrant in Saudi Arabia in the last 20 or 30 years. But um, what is interesting is this vibrant scene was suppressed um, uh, uh, during those previous years. And when Mohammed bin Salman came to power, he realized that there is an underground art scene and he co-opted it by creating institutions and appointing these very, very famous international artists who sell their art for um, you know, thousands of dollars um, and uh, recruited them uh, in order to control the art scene. And this is very typical of these uh, kind of uh, absolute monarchy or uh, authoritarian regimes, once there is something underground, they don't want it to be independent. So they try to project themselves as patrons of the art, but in fact, the patronage comes with controlling the artists. Uh, so among, among the uh, people I interviewed in the book, there was uh, an, an artist by the name of Ms. Safa, and she's a, a flourishing artist in Australia. But her art can never be shown in Saudi Arabia because it is regarded as subversive. So at the end, yes, there is a flourishing art scene in Saudi Arabia, but without freedom, it is very difficult to see um, how this can develop further and reach sort of a, a high standard. Uh, it is it is very difficult for artists who have uh, a different message, an alternative voice or an alternative message to find their place in the country. And this is why Ms. Safa's left. So is, is the flourishing art scene in 
something that the diaspora is doing because it's impossible to do within Saudi Arabia? At the moment, there is art in Saudi Arabia, but it is only the artists who are subversive or who touch on what is regarded as taboo in Saudi Arabia. So um, uh, political issues or poverty. Or, so if you want to, do, to be an Orientalist artist, uh, t taking sort of representing in images or paintings the deserts and the or sort of you know the the women in the veil then you might succeed uh, also you know in order to to be eclectic you can't do that in Saudi Arabia and and my interviews with these um, artists prove that uh, they will be in danger if if they uh, return to Saudi Arabia. And also amongst them, there is a minority of uh, people with a sort of different sexualities and their art represent a kind of expression of their, of their uh, sexuality. And that may not be appreciated in Saudi Arabia. Interesting. Um, Madawi, where fast running out of time but i think uh, one more question do you think that in recent times the kingdom has become more moderate and is likely to continue to be more liberal in the future and that's from a member of our audience yeah um, it depends what you mean by moderate if mm -hmm. if you uh, travel to saudi arabia as a foreigner for example you will have uh, more freedoms uh, than the local women uh, so you're allowed to visit places on your own. You're allowed to uh, uh, wear uh, clothes that don't conform to the local tradition. For example, certain kind of black cloak, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it becomes moderation or being moder moderate uh, is limited. Uh, you may have certain freedoms in the country, uh, but um, I think these personal freedom are projected as an alternative to political freedom. So you could a, a woman can take her car and drive in Saudi Arabia, which is uh, you know great for many many women, especially working women, mothers who need to run errands and and go to work. Uh, but uh, if you if you are an outspoken woman like Lujain Al Hudloun, uh, you can drive your car now. But if you uh, express an opinion or a critical view of government policy, whatever that government policy is, you can actually drive yourself to prison. <laughs> Astonishing. Madawi, we have finally run out of time. I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening, for taking part in what has been an absolutely fascinating hour. Thank you, Madawi. Thank you very much. And thank you for the British Academy for organizing this. I'd also like to thank our audience for some great questions and to remind you that you can purchase a copy of Madawi's book with the British Academy discount code, which you should be getting very soon. A reminder to you that this is our fourth in a series of events called Why History. The next event is in February and you will find details of that on the British Academy website soon. Thank you again to Madawi and thank you very much.